Well, thank you very much, Jim. Can every, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. You understand the southern accent all right? Look, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry for some of you who hear the same jokes over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to tell a story uh, just to start off with. I know there's at least one refugee from California here, but uh, there's a few in the room, and you'll relate to this. I was in Los Angeles, and uh, I walk up to a street vendor and I bought some food, he gave me the money, and the change, and, and he said, you've got an accent, um, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? <laughs> so, to make it really, really easy for him, I said, look, it's down near Australia. He said, ah, where Arnold Schwarzenegger came from. <laughs> so never let your education system get like California's. <laughs> But um, as I'm from New Zealand, people always ask me the same thing, you know. I've been all over your beautiful country, and this is one of my very favorite states, and I've got a lot of good friends in this state. And I've got to say, you're very well organized here. I'm very, very pleased at what I see here. I think it's going to go very well in the 2020 elections for, for us. In this so, I, uh, people always ask, you know, why would I care about America? You know, I've got a perfectly good country down in the Pacific. And I say there are two reasons. The first is gratitude. You know, my country was facing invasion during World War II from the Imperial Japanese Army. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, we would have been done, folks. It's a very strong memory even today. The second reason is related, but it's a little more selfish. You know, Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom should ever fail in the United States, if you lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority, all of which took a huge trashing through the Obama years, had that continued, people, we would soon be living in a world run out of Moscow and Beijing and Tehran and Havana. And is that the kind of world you'd like to leave to your children and grandchildren, people? Yes. So anybody who cares about liberty has to care about this country. Because if this country goes, there ain't nowhere to run. There ain't nowhere. And now people say, look, can I come down and live in New Zealand? And I say, well, as long as you learn Chinese, you'll be fine. You know, because they are already knocking on our doorstep, folks. They are buying up our politicians, they are buying up our land, our utilities. Recently, not long ago, the Australian Minister of Defence. Now, if you don't know where Australia is, it's a little island off our west coast. Okay? But anyway, he was up in China for talks, and a, and a, a top Chinese general publicly said to him, Australia needs a godfather. Will it be an American godfather or a Chinese godfather? If you are smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. How do you think we felt when Obama was gutting the Seventh Fleet people and bringing you out of the Pacific? It was not a good feeling, I'll tell you. So, America is the last stand. Now, I want to say a couple of things now about the 2016 election. And the first thing I'll say, does anybody think there might have been a touch of the miraculous on that election? Just a little? Okay. Even the atheists would have to agree with that. Because sure. okay. we all knew Hillary was going to win. Well, it's all preordained, but it didn't happen. But I see that election... And I'm sure you don't, but there's some on our side who think, well, Trump got in, it's all over now, we can just go on living our lives. He's got it in hand. You know, like George Washington won the revolution all by himself, you know. And so, but I see it a little bit differently. That election gave us a second chance, maybe a last chance. You know, the country had been going to socialism for 100 years, was on the edge of the cliff and was about to go over. And we got pulled back. Well, if you look at the Old Testament, there was a lot of times when the Israelites got a second chance, right? You know, you're not doing the right thing, I'll give you another chance. But how many times did they get a third chance? 
So we're on our second chance, people, and we better use it. Um, I don't have to tell you, I know you all know this. Um, the other thing I'll say, a little more cynical. Now, the Germans have a wonderful phrase, it's schadenfreude. It means to take pleasure in the pain of others. And it's not a noble thing, right? You don't boast about it. But on election night 2016, about two o'clock in the morning, and I'm sure you're all watching, when they panned the Democratic Party headquarters in New York, and you saw those little snowflakes bawling their eyes out, <laughs> each other, do you feel a little bit of schadenfreude? Do you think after eight years of Obama trashing your country, maybe you deserved it? Well, imagine how much you're going to feel in 2020, folks. Imagine. If that felt good in 2016, it's going to feel way better in 2020. And that should be an incentive in itself. So what we're talking about here, we're, you know, Bishop Jackson and I, we would stand against communism. And people say, well, you know, communism died and, you know, they were saying this till five years ago. Communism died in, you know, 1989, 91. It was all over. You know, the Berlin Wall fell. But look, say if you compare, if you compare the Soviet Union, if you compare, if you compare communism to a cancer, something that <coughs> parasitizes a body and grows and grows till it destroys its own host. If you compare the Soviet Union, say you cut out 90% of the cancer, you destroy most of the Soviet Union, not all of it, but you leave China and Cuba and North Korea, and you, you cut that out. If you cut out 90% of a tumour in your body, then stop all treatment for 20 years, what are you going to look like? You're going to get dead. You're going to metastasize. It's going to go everywhere. You know, compare communism to organised crime. You know, which is very much a parallel because it's really a, a political, a criminal political system. Say, if you went into, if you were a law enforcement officer in New York and you took out the Gambino family, you know, the one, one of the five big families, you took them out, you said, it's all over, we've defeated the mafia, it's all over now, and you just stopped all law enforcement for the next 20 years. What would New York look like by then? Chicago. Like it is now, yeah. Like Chicago, yeah. But the, the point is this. Communism will always be with us. Like organised crime will always be with us. Like cancer will always be with us. It is the dark side of human nature organised in a scientific manner. We've always had some form of communism right back to the days of the pharaohs. And we always will. It might be called something else, but it'll always be that collective tyrannical streak in humanity that is organized and attracts the power hungry people who spend all their time trying to basically make you their slaves that's what it is and that will never go away so we've always got to be vigilant you know they say well there's no communism in america well what, what's black lives matter you know that's controlled by the freedom road socialist organization a pro-chinese communist group what was the woman's march a million women, you know, protesting Trump with their funny hats on, led by, led by um, you, uh, uh, the, you know, Linda Sarsour, who's a Marxist, but also um, Judith LeBlanc of the Communist Party USA. All of the leaders of that movement are communist people. And I guarantee you most of the women who marched with their silly hats had no idea they were being used. Um, every college campus in this country is infested by communists and Marxists. Most of your churches are now infested by communism and Marxism. You know, Catholics know the problem with the Pope, but that's also... Yeah, exactly, but it's also now in the evangelical churches. It's even the Southern Baptists are picking up this stuff now. So, you have, you have a cancer spreading through your society. Now, has anybody in the room ever had to undergo any form of FBI background check or security check for a government position? Yeah, okay, about a quarter of the room, okay? Now, now, is it true that those checks are pretty darn rigorous? Yep, so they'll go and check out your family background, they'll interview your pastor, your childhood friends, uh, check your finances, overseas travel, criminal convictions, bounce checks, everything. Because they need to know that you're a trustworthy individual. 
because they understand, you know, what, what did your founding fathers say when they gave you that famous oath that the military take? I will defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? Because they understood that America would be very hard to take from the outside, so it would probably be done from the inside. So they, they understood that. Now, so if you're a member of Congress, well, say you're a young Marxist radical or you hang around with the Muslim, some Muslim Brotherhood front group and you get elected to Congress because the local Democratic Party is just full of radicals and you call yourself a Liberal Democrat and you get appointed to the Homeland Security Committee or the Armed Services Committee or even the Intelligence Committee of the House of Representatives, how much of an FBI background check do you need for that? No. Zero. Nothing at all. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you do it, right? Well, how's, it, how's that been working out? You see the problem there straight away. So there's zero background checks in Congress. You can serve on the Armed Services Committee, have access to all sorts of defence data, and there's no background checks. Do you think foreign enemies may be aware of this? Do you think the Cubans know about this, or the Iranians, or the Russians, or the Chinese? And your congressmen are mixing with these people and playing golf with them, going to parties with them. Do you not think they might try and co-opt some of your congressmen? You think they'd be stupid enough not to? No background checks in Congress whatsoever. But we have a last line of defense, right? Because the media is not going to touch them. There's no background checks. But we have the FBI, right? The Federal Bureau of Investigation, who is charged with rooting spies and terrorists and communists and radicals out of your government. That's their job. And we saw what a fine job they did with Hillary Clinton, right? They just didn't leave her alone, right? They just hammered in to find the truth and prosecute her just as she deserved to be prosecuted. Is that how it worked? Well, why, why would they? Because she might be their boss one day. You think they're stupid enough to attack the person who's going to be their boss? So there's a big weakness in your system, folks. Now, the Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives is the body that oversees the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Justice Department. Now, so the federal FBI is supposed to catch the bad guys and the Justice Department is supposed to prosecute them. Again, that's gone a little bit astray in recent times, right? And just by the way, Comey was a communist in college, as was Mr. Brennan. You should read that wonderful book, um, The Red Thread by Diana West. And she said, basically, most of what we call a deep state, now, now Lee, all, all these people have communist backgrounds. All of these people are communist folks. And that's why they want to bring this president to his knees. So the FBI is supposed to do this. It's controlled by the, it was overseen by the Judiciary Committee. Now, does anybody remember a congressman called John Conyers? Yeah. 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 He served for 140, 160 years <laughs> you know, in Congress. One of your, lo lo since 1962, I believe he was there. And for, I would say he's one of your most dangerous, treasonous congressmen. You know, he was the man who was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee for more than 40 years. He oversaw the FBI for 40 years. He was the man who abolished your House Un-American Activities Committee, one of your last lines of defense against internal subversion. He had a 50-year history with the Communist Party USA. His, part of, his father was active before him. 40 years with Democratic Socialists of America. He was at their founding conference. And DSA is actually more left-wing than the Communist Party. He had a 30-year history with the Workers' World Party, which supports North Korea and Cuba and Iran. And he was a very active supporter of several Muslim Brotherhood front groups. Now, if you're not sure who the Muslim Brotherhood is, they were formed in Egypt in the late 1920s as a secret society to re-establish the caliphate, worldwide Islam. And they worked with the Nazis in World War II, then they worked with the Soviet KGB after that, which taught them their tradecraft. So 
They are the father of Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS. They are banned in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and several other countries, but here they work openly through the Council on American Islamic Relations, Muslim Student Association, and many other groups. And your congressmen and senators are in bed with them in a big way. So when some of your Republicans tried to get the Muslim Brotherhood designated as a, commun as a, as a subversive organization, which is a terrorist group, which it actually is, John Conyers says, oh no, no, we can't do that. They're, they're a peaceful social service agency now. We should be working with them, not against them. Right. On that committee with John Conyers, for a long time, you had Luis Gutierrez from Illinois, who was a former leader of the pro-Cuban, Marxist-Leninist, Puerto Rican Socialist Party, active with the Communist Party and several Muslim Brotherhood front groups. On that committee now, you have a woman called Judy Chu from California, from the San Gabriel Valley, a long-time supporter of the Communist Workers' Party, the most militant pro-Chinese group in the country, goes to China all the time to build business ties between China and California, has been described as China's best friend in your Congress by the Chinese press, and you should see Judy Chu attack the FBI whenever they have the temerity to arrest one of the more than 25,000 Chinese spies currently working in this country. You are racist, she says. The FBI is a racist organization. You're only persecuting these poor people because you hate Asians. And she has arranged for sensitivity training for these cruel FBI agents so they don't persecute these poor Chinese people. Now, Sean Hannity and others have been really upset recently because you've got a socialist in Congress, Ocasio-Cortez. This is something really new, apparently, and they're tearing their hair. How could America have an open socialist in Congress? The Green New Deal, which Stalin would have been proud of, Medicare for all, all these things, and they're right to call her out. But the head of the Judiciary Committee the man that will be leading the impeachment of your president if it gets off the ground is a man called Jerry Nadler from New York. Jerry Nadler has been an active member or supporter of Democratic Socialists of America since at least 1977. He is a Marxist, folks. Yet he heads the FBI, he basically oversees the FBI with Judy Chu and all the other Marxists. So what's going to happen if the FBI says, uh, Mr. Nadler, Mrs. Chu, uh, we have information that some of you, our congressmen are disloyal and we need to investigate them. May we have some money for that? And just by the way, you are both on the list. <laughs> How do you think that's going to go, folks? You think the FBI is going to bite the hand that feeds them? You have got, I'll give you one more example, Andre Carson from Indiana, one of your three Muslim members of Congress. Big time supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood. I've got him on tape, my, my movie. He gets up in front of a, a Muslim Brotherhood front support, support group in Connecticut in 2012. And he says, people, I've been told there are people in the audience that are here spying on us. They're here undercover because they believe we are here plotting to destroy this country. Well, I say to you spies, I say to you undercover people, Allah will not allow you to stop us. <laughs> this man serves on the intelligence committee people, overseeing the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the DEA, you name it. There's at least four Marxists on the intelligence committee, at least five on the Homeland Security Committee, including the chairman, Benny Thompson, a similar number, several Communist Party supporters on the Armed Services Committee. Every committee in your Congress is infiltrated by Marxists, and many of them are led by Marxists. And it's a similar situation in the US Senate, and just thank God that the Republicans are in charge in that body. You have got at least 100 members of your House right now, and 20 members of the Senate, who are so enmeshed in neo-communism, um, were involved with the Cubans, the Chinese, the Nicaraguans or the Venezuelans, 
They couldn't pass an FBI background check to drive a school bus. But there are no background checks, so they're okay. How can you survive when 20% of your government is working for the other team people? That's your problem. That's why all these bad laws get passed. That's why you can never get anything done. That's why you've got $15 an hour minimum wages, nuclear deal with Iran, Obamacare, immigration amnesty. All these are communist policies pushed through your government by the Marxists and traitors within your Congress and your Senate. People who completely are dedicated to destroying your constitution and your way of life because they have a socialist dream, folks. And it's right now. It's not 50 years ago, it's now. So, what about the presidential candidates? Okay, because uh, once you get to that level, surely there'd be no radicals left at that level. <laughs> we all know Barack Obama was a super patriot and loved this country and the Constitution and all that kind of thing. Barack Obama couldn't have passed a background check to work in the post office, people. There is no way with his extensive communist, Islamist, and even terrorist connections through Bill Ayers and Rashid Khalidi and others, there's no way he could have got any job at any level of the US government if they'd applied the proper tests. But he was, well, didn't even have that. But you know, so he, but he was president for eight years, folks. The damage he did to this country is you will be feeling it for years. The damage he did to your military alone could put millions of Americans' lives at risk. He's just a, a disaster. This what happens if you have no background checks and you just take people on face value. Now, but well, let's look at the current top five. You know, um, there's about 23 Democrats got in the race. And it's come down to about five now. You've got Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie, and Biden, okay? Now, Biden is the moderate of the bunch, right? He's the, he's the, he's the moderate one. He's the old-fashioned, blue-collar Democrat that we all grew up with and many of us probably once were. Now, Joe Biden, we said he's got a little bit of trouble with his son involved in the Ukraine. But you've got to understand, the Ukraine was run at that time by pro-Russian elements. They kicked them out and now it's anti-Russian. But when Biden was doing, Bo Biden was doing his dirty deals, that was when the Russians were in control. He was working with the Russians people. And so, but if you look at, you go right back, Joe Biden was elected in 1972 as a 29-year-old city councillor. That's what he was. And he beat a four-term popular senator. It was considered impossible. The reason he did it, he was backed by an organisation called the Council for a Livable World. And they were set up in 1962 by a man called Leo Seilard. And the idea was you, you get some money together and you invest in far left senators, Senate candidates in small states. Small states means a small budget. You can get a senator elected in Delaware or New Hampshire or Maine a lot cheaper than you can in California or Texas. So they concentrated in those states, South Dakota, Maine, etc. They picked these far leftists. And the deal was, we'll get you elected, but we want you to work for nuclear arms control and the gutting of the US military. That was your mission. The Council for a Livable World was found, Leo Szilard founded it. He was a Hungarian communist um, who became a Manhattan Project scientist, helped to develop your atom bomb, was a major security risk. And after he'd done that job, he, st he set about disarming America to the benefit of the Soviet Union. Now, according to Pavel Sudoplatov, who was a top-ranking Soviet intelligence officer, who defected and wrote a book, Leo Szilard was a fully recruited Soviet agent. <coughs> fully recruited. So he basically set up the organization that got Joe Biden elected. The man who actually put it all together was a man called Al Gore Sr. You might know his son, okay? The man who invented the internet and global warming, okay? 
<laughs> well, Al Gore Sr. was a protege of another man called Armand Hammer. Some of you may have heard of him. One of the leading Soviet agents of the 20th century. Lenin's friend, the man who kept the Bolshevik revolution alive and made millions of dollars doing it. He had two Soviet agents who basically got him into power. And he worked every day while he was in your Senate to gut your military, cancel your weapons programs. He boasts, and I've, I've got him on tape saying this, he said at their 50th anniversary, he said, I have worked with the Council for Liberal World for my entire political career. They have helped me every step of the way and they just helped us to negotiate the START II treaty with Russia, which happened under Obama, which gave the Russians a huge advantage over the United States. He has worked to the benefit of Russia and China his entire political career. They got him into power and have been his friend ever since. Extremely dangerous man. Extremely dangerous. So what about little Pete Buttigieg from Indiana? You know, he's a cute little guy, right? He's just a nice, sensible young man and very Midwestern values. Has anybody ever heard of um, a man called Antonio Gramsci? Well, he was an Italian communist, the leading theoretician of the Italian, Com Italian Communist Party. And he is the guiding light of today's communist movement. Because he had the idea, all your racial politics, political correctness, all comes out of Gramsci. It's all Gramsci. He had the idea, you don't have a workers' revolution. That's not going to work, especially not in America, because people don't buy into this class struggle garbage. What you've got to do is get into all the institutions and change the people's consciousness. You gotta get into the churches, you gotta get into education, into the unions, into both political parties, and you gotta change the culture of the people until they welcome socialism. A little bit like the Bernie kids today, right? They are Gramsci's children, completely Gramsci's children. And so, Pete Buttigieg's father was Joseph Buttigieg. Uh, he died earlier this year, and he was the leading Gramsci scholar in the world. He was president of the World Gramsci Society. What do you think Pete used to talk about over breakfast with his dad? Now, Democratic Socialists of America is a Gramsciist organization. Pete was on their mailing list as a teenager. He uh, won an essay competition, went to uh, national essay competition, all about his great socialist hero, Bernie Sanders, and has worked heavily with Democratic Socialists of America in South Bend, Indiana, has backed their strikes, and he was just over in Cape Cod less than a month ago supporting one of their strikes amongst bu bus drivers on Cape Cod. Pete Buttigieg is a complete Gramsci Marxist. That's what he is. But Gramsci is all about selling it soft. You know, you don't talk about revolution, you talk about social change. But that's what he is. Elizabeth Warren um, has been actively involved with Democratic Socialists of America for more than 15 years. Also heavily involved with a pro-Chinese communist group called the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And it was a bit, but they, there's a big division on the left right now because the Working Families Party just endorsed her instead of Bernie, who they endorsed last time. That's because the Freedom, the Freedom Road Socialist Organisation controls the Working Families Party and they've decided to make Elizabeth Warren their candidate. She is a complete and utter Marxist, 100%. So we start to see a pattern here in any way. So then you've got Bernie himself. Well, the difference between Bernie Sanders democratic socialism and communism is about five years. It's just a step on the way. He has worked with the Communist Party and Democratic Socialists of America his entire career. He went to Nicaragua to meet the Sandinistas. He went to Cuba to meet Castro. He honeymooned in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. He is still working with the Communist Party. They completely control his movement right now. He does nothing. The Green New Deal, all of the policies he's promoting come straight out of the Communist Party. All of them. And they, uh, his Sanders Institute works with Greek communists, 
Latin American communists. Um, you know, he talks about, I want to make America like France or Germany or Norway. Well, why are all the people he works with not from there, but from the Communist Party of Austria, from the Communist Party of Brazil, from the Communist Party of whatever? He doesn't have anybody from Norway or Holland on his, any of his boards or associates. That leaves one more, and I believe, still I'm hanging on to this, that she will be the nominee. But whether I'm right or wrong, they are all Marxists, and that is Kamala Harris. Now, Kamala Harris's father was a Marxist professor at Stanford. They, Democratic Socialists of America recruited him as an affirmative action Marxist. They didn't have enough Marxists on their staff, so they went and found one and they actually recruited him to the, to the university. Him and his wife, who was a descendant of an Indian, you know, Asian Indian revolutionary family, were early founders of a group that became the Black Panther Party. Um, Kamala Harris uh, went to Howard University where she worked with the Marxists there. Then she went back to San Francisco and she hooked up with Willie Brown, who became the mayor of San Francisco, a lifelong Communist Party supporter and one of the biggest pro-Chinese radicals in San Francisco. And the Chinese run San Francisco. It's completely run out of Beijing. So she has promoted several Marxists through her career, including one who was a member of the Standing Together to organize a revolutionary movement to who worked with that with a man called Van Jones. She is completely a Marxist and she is the protege of a man called Stephen Phillips, a former member of the League of Revolutionary Struggle, who married into the Sandler family of San Francisco, who had a savings and loan they sold for $26 billion to Wachovia, pocketed $2.6 billion, half of which they put into the left-wing movement. They, they said they together they set up the Democracy Alliance, which is the which is Tom Steyer, George Soros, Norman Lear, about 150 left wing billionaires, and Steve Phillips tells them where to put it. Steve Phillips's logic is real simple: Democrats don't go to the middle. Forget the middle. Forget the middle. Stop wasting all your money trying to ship one percent of the population to your direction. There are millions of people in the southern states, the southwestern states, particularly Latinos, blacks, um, whatever, who are Democrats, but they don't vote. That's where you put your money. He argues in his book, Brown is the New White, which was endorsed by Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama, 23% of the electorate are progressives of color. 28% are white progressives. 23 plus 28 is 51%. The new American majority. We just gotta get them voting. Steve Phillips and Kamala Harris both backed Andrew Gillum, the Marxist who almost won the governor's race in Florida last year, lifted the Democrat vote by 40%. They almost won in, in Georgia with Stacey Abrams, another Steve Phillips protege, backed by Kamala Harris. They, they lifted the black vote there by something like 35%. They did win in Arizona with Kirsten Sinema, the Communist Party supporter who is now a senator, uh, because there were 200,000, Trump won Arizona by 200,000 votes, but there were 600,000 Latinos in that state who could have voted but didn't, and that's who they signed up. That's where all the money is going. They're going to make this election completely about race. It's all going to be identity politics, and they aim to win with 51, 52, 53% of the vote. That's their plan. Now, the great news is Donald Trump's been screwing it up for them. <laughs> because, um, because now Latino support for Trump has gone up 25% in Texas. And um, black support for Trump is around the 25% mark, which you haven't seen since Abraham Lincoln people. You know, why, why, did, why did Trump win Michigan? Because instead of 96% of the black population in that state voting Democrat, only 92% did. 
And this is freaking the Democrats out, people, because their path to victory is to cobble all the minorities together until they get 51%. And if they lose 5 or 10% of the black community, they're done. If they lose 5 or 10% of the Latino community, they can never win again. And that doesn't even count those white union guys out in Pennsylvania and Ohio that Trump brought across. If that continues, folks, the whole democratic playbook crumbles. This is why this is a super critical election, because it's the Democrats' last chance. Their plan is they're going to try and destroy Trump any way they can, they destroy his base, and they're going to run either Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris, and I believe it will be Kamala Harris, at the top of the ticket to energize the black and Latino vote. And when they win, they will then legalize all of the 22 million illegals in the country right now who will vote how much Democrat, do you think? You know, Mitt Romney lost his election by, 12, by two and a half million votes. Donald Trump won by about 200,000, thanks to the wisdom of your founding fathers and the Electoral College, and lost the popular vote by three million. So what do you think's gonna, why do you think Hillary Clinton promised to legalize every single illegal immigrant in the country within 100 days of taking office? That would have given the Democrats 15, 16 million new votes for the next election. You would immediately have lost North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, and probably Texas. How are you gonna win ever again if that happens, folks? How do you do it? So I want you to understand on election night 2016, you are that close to losing your country. That close. I did, I did math before Common Core people. I'm confident <laughs> of my figures. So this is why, as they say all the time, this is the most important election of our lives. Well, this one is. Because if Trump, when, when Trump wins again, you're going to have an economic boom like you've never seen. Those taxes are going to keep coming down. The regulations are going to keep coming off. You're energy dependent now. You're going to have a wall to keep the illegals out. So when all this money comes flowing into your economy, you're not going to have an endless supply of illegal labor to keep wages down. Your wages are going to go up like you've never, ever seen. You're going to have an economic boom like you've never seen before. So how do you think the Democrats' chances are going to rate after another four years of that, folks? <laughs> they're done. This is why they're so desperate. It's their last shot. Either they win and destroy the country, or we win and destroy them. That's what it's coming down to. And I want to add one more thing before I finish. You know, one of the most important things your president's done, and he's done lots of them, is to change the composition of the judiciary. He has put more conservative judges into the judiciary than any other president. Even the Ninth Circuit is now almost conservative, folks. This is going to have massive implications for your religious liberties, your gun rights, regulations, education, all of these things in the next few years. Now, the big problem has always been in this country for many years. For 60 years, the left have controlled the Supreme Court. And they will make a decision which is completely unconstitutional. They'll call that precedent. Then they'll pile another decision on top of that and another one on top of that until 70% of what your federal government does is unconstitutional. And that's holding you back with your business regulations. It's screwing up your education system. It has massive implications for your freedom of speech, your Second Amendment rights, all the things that make America great. Well, now, after 60 years, you have a 5-4 majority on the Supreme Court. And I know that Roberts is a flake, people. Don't worry, I know that. But at least he votes your way more than he doesn't. And a lot of very good decisions have come down. Well, you imagine six years' time. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is getting pretty old, people. You know, she's in well into her 80s now. She's had three cancer scares. People, six more years. She has said publicly she would like to go and retire in New Zealand. That's what she wants to do, all right? Okay. Well, I'm willing to take one for the team, people.
I'll do it. I'll suck it up. She can come down there, play bingo all day long, and you'll have a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court. Okay? Imagine what that will do to wind back Roe v. Wade, all the unethical government programs you've been pushed on you, the corruption of re your education system, all the things conservatives have been fighting for for years will be within your ability to change for the first time in your lifetimes. Is that worth getting fired up about, folks? That chance, that chance to take your country back. And it all depends on what happens over the next 16 months, 15 months. So what I'm saying, real clear, we are facing, Donald Trump said the 26th, Donald Trump Jr. said the 2016 election will be communism versus freedom. And he was not exaggerating. Not at all. So the downside is horrible. If we do not make mu the maximum use of this God-given chance we've been given. We'll only have ourselves to blame if we blow this, folks. But the upside is fantastic. You'll have an economic boom like you've never seen. You'll have a liberty boom like you've never seen. But most of all, you will have a chance to hand your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to say to you people, thank you so much for what you do for liberty, for America, and for my country. God bless America, and God bless New Hampshire, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Trevor. As always, thank you. Uh, what an honor it is to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, you could ask the question, why in the world am I doing this? 67 years old. Because I took an oath in August of 1970 in a Marine Corps office, raised my hand to the Constitution of the United States and said I would preserve, protect, and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that oath never had an expiration date. And I am more committed to its fulfillment now even than I was then because at that time I didn't see the threat that I see now. And folks, my wife and I just started a school in our church. I am a pastor. I preach every Sunday morning. Uh, my wife and I just started a school in our church and we've called it the Maximum Potential Academy because we understood that trying to help children escape the cultural pathologies and anomalies that hold them down and hold them back. You know, ben Carson recently said poverty is a spirit and of course the mainstream media just went crazy. You know, who is it? What is, what is he talking about? Well, he was talking about that set of attitudes and ideas that keeps people locked in poverty. And during one of the sessions we were having with the children, um, we got to talking about travel, and one of them mentioned that they wanted to go to Paris. And, and I said, well, you know, that'd be great to visit Paris. I said, you, you have to understand, and this, this is a kid about uh, 11 years old, 10 or 11 years old. You have to understand that you be visiting, you won't be a citizen of Paris. And you know what the response, I said, you're a citizen of the United States. You know what the response was? What's a citizen? <laughs> That's why half of our millennials prefer socialism over capitalism because they're not being taught anything about what it means to be an American. In fact, they're being taught a polemic against America. A young man from the Navy was a member of my church for several years because, of course, we're right. Uh, there in the Norfolk area and the largest naval base in the world is there and he came through our church and he was there for I don't know maybe three years two or three years and before he left he said I want to thank you for something I said what's that he said believe it or not when I joined this church I hated my country he said here I am serving the Navy in the Navy but I hated my country he said and I hated it because somebody introduced me to a book by Zen called 
a people's history of the United States. He said, and that thing embittered me and made me feel like America's a terrible place, a horrible place. And, and folks, this stuff is not happening by accident. This is by design. Because there are people who don't like this country for what it represents and what it's been to us and to the world, and they want to change it. Now, Karl Marx theorized that communism would come by violent revolution, that you had to overthrow the bourgeoisie. But Antonio Gramsci, who Trevor has alluded to several times, came around with a different theory. He was born in 1891, died in 1937, but he wrote a great deal. And his attitude was, and I really believe that he, he came to this by observing the United States of America, that no, 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 you can't overthrow a country like the United States with violence. What you have to do is you have to subvert it from within. You have to take over the cultural institutions of that country. You have to change what he called cultural hegemony. You subvert the culture. You change attitudes. You change ideas. You change what people believe. And they will embrace communism on their own. Sound familiar? Because that's exactly what's happened in our country. And really, I think it began long before the 60s, but it accelerated during the 60s. And really, what he basically said was, you don't need to, as violent communists once did, you don't need to force people not to believe in God. What you do is you redefine who God is and what he wants. I was trying to hold an event in Richmond, Virginia one time, and we had found a church that would open its doors to us. And I got a call from them a few days after we had secured it. And they said, well, we're not allowing you to come. And I said, well, why not? They said, we found out who you are. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? They said, we're not letting somebody in our church who believes that two gay men or gay women should not be able to get married. And we're not letting anybody into our church who will deny a woman's right to choose. And we're not letting anybody into our church who is a conservative or a Republican, you're not coming in here. Of course, I ultimately said, well, I thought you were a church, so now that I know you're not, I don't want to come. <laughs> but think about that, folks. Even conservative denominations are being infiltrated right now. So look, you know, if you could convince people, as is being argued now, that Jesus was a socialist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people are complaining about this pope. Or you can, you can convince them that liberation theology is really what the Bible teaches. And, and, and liberation theology, as we know, is nothing but Marxism clothed in Christian language. That's all it is. So you don't, you don't need to, to, to say, well, you can't believe in God. You can simply change what that means, and you still got them. So you don't really need to close the church. Church, you just, you just change its mission. Church is supposed to be about personal salvation, a relationship with God, righteous living, right? Redemption. No, 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 no. The church is about social justice. You see? You don't, you don't need you. Castro and, and many communist revolutions imprisoned and killed intellectuals. You don't need to do that. You just raise up a crop of them that believe all the garbage that you want them to believe. And that's exactly what we've got in our country right now. Our colleges and universities are filled with them. Sadly, our public schools are filled with them. And you know, Marx said that the family was a, 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 a promoter of the bourgeois values that needed to be overthrown. Well, you don't need to get rid of the family anymore. You just redefine what it is. It's no longer a mother and a father raising children. You know, now it can be anything people want it to be. And by the way, you don't have to propagate the values that make our culture work of, of individual responsibility and individual liberty and, and, and personal work ethic and, and personal morality and integrity and decency towards your neighbor. You don't need the government to tell you how to treat your neighbor. You, you treat other people the way you want to be treated. But that, we didn't have to have the government tell us to do that. Tell people all the time, when, the, when, when I take money out of my pocket and give it to you, that's compassion. 
But when the government reaches in my pocket and takes my money and gives it to whom it thinks worthy, no matter what I think, that's not compassion, that's compulsion. But see, we're teaching people, no, 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 that's, that's true compassion. Because if you're truly compassionate, you'll let the government take whatever it wants. Who is it? I think it's uh, Elizabeth Warren, or is it Bernie Sanders? But they're, they're proposing large, very, very high tax levels because after all, that's what it's going to take for us to be compassionate toward others. So you just, you just subvert everything. You change the meaning of everything. Um, one Marxist theorist called it cultural terrorism. I mean, we had a, a guy in West Point, Virginia, who had a kid brought to him who was told this was a boy, he's now a girl, or vice versa. And he was told that from this point forward, this is an English teacher, was told, you will now refer to him not as he or she, but as they. And he said, well, I teach grammar. Why would I call a singular person by a plural pronoun? They fired him. Kelvin Cocker is a friend of mine. He was the, the uh, chief of the fire department for Atlanta. And Kasim Reed, the black mayor, found out that Kelvin Cocker not was doing anything on the job as fire chief, but that he was a member of a church and he was going around speaking at churches, affirming marriage as a union between one man and one woman. He was reported for having done so, and the mayor suspended him from his job for bigotry. And then after investigating, fired. Now, ultimately, he did win. Uh, the, the city ultimately paid him, compensated him, because they said he was discriminated against for his religious beliefs. But, but by that time, his career was over. I mean, th this, is, this is cultural terrorism, folks. This is, in fact, look, we're not living in a state of, of governmental totalitarianism, but we're already living in cultural totalitarianism right now. Because if a person works for a corporation, and they dare express biblical or conservative values or God forbid express support for Donald Trump you're probably going to lose your job or you're certainly not going to get promoted you're going to get shut it aside Google did a seminar on family and because the guy doing the seminar didn't acknowledge the many permutations there are of family today they had an uprising at Google saying, well, he's a bigot and a hater, and, and Google had to apologize and bring somebody else in who would talk about family as it's now defined today. Drew Brees just endorsed the idea of children taking their Bibles to school and was suddenly attacked as a bigot and a hater. Folks, we're living in cultural totalitarianism now. Right. The only difference is they don't have control of the state primarily because of President Donald Trump and the work that you all do on the ground. But we've got to make sure that they never have it because I'll tell you something, if they ever get full control of the government, the kind of control they want, I don't believe that there's any limit to the depths to which they sink in how they treat us. They call us haters. We are not haters. I mean, I, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't hate anybody. I don't hate my worst enemy. I don't hate the person who disagrees with me. I, I hate their ideas. I hate their policies, and the Bible teaches me I'm supposed to hate what is false. I'm supposed to hate what is untrue. But I don't hate them, but they hate us with a passion. I remember when Kim Davis, a little cute, cute little woman, wouldn't sign a, a certificate of marriage for two homosexuals, and, and she ultimately was, of course, put in jail by the judge uh, for contempt of court, and they reveled in it. They reveled in her sitting in prison. They thought it was great. They talked about it on Twitter. They loved it. Because they want to see us suffer. They want to see us in pain. They want to see us destroyed. And folks, if we don't stand up for what we know is true and right and good, it's not just about us. But at my age, I'm thinking now about our grandchildren and what kind of America they're going to grow up in, and whether they will know the freedom that we have enjoyed. We've got to make sure that we are standing up for what we know is right, because this stuff has insinuated itself and infiltrated our culture in such a way that the future is, in my view, in doubt. I think it's in our hands, but it is clearly in doubt. 
Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and passed on to them to do the same. We will spend our sunset years telling our children about the United States of America, where once we were free. We cannot allow that to happen. Uh, we've got to be absolutely committed to the values that we know made America the greatest nation on earth. And by the way, the, all this racial stuff, folks, it's right out of the Marxist playbook. Because look, here's the thing. You can't convince people. Marx thought that all of life can be understood as class warfare. But you know, you can't sell that in America because people are so upwardly mobile. I was born into a broken home. My wife was raised in the projects. I was born into poverty. My father had a third, a, a sixth grade education, I was a third class welder in Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company. I spent the first 10 years of my life in foster care because of my parents being broken up. And my father finally came and took custody of me, custody of me at the age of 10 years old. So I didn't have an easy life, but my father watched me graduate from Harvard Law School. He watched me become a lawyer. He watched me do things he could never imagine doing. But that's America, folks. That's America. And by the way, this is a message we need to carry to all these socialists. We don't need more government spending and we don't need a government program. The thing we need more than anything else to bring stability back to our society is we need to get fathers back in the homes. Yeah. We need to get the family strengthened. And we need to get people believing that the family is the key institution in society. And, and, and so, look, we've got to help people understand what is going on. And that's what Stand Against Communism about, is about. We started this several months ago uh, because we felt that Americans are not sufficiently alarmed. They're not. You know, the more I study this and the more I learn about it from researchers, and we've got other people with us. Uh, Trevor is our key guy, but Jerome Corsi is with us, and, and Alan West is with us, and uh, Diane West is with us. Um, Reverend Rafael Cruz, who escaped Castro's Cuba, is part of our coalition. Uh, but this stuff is deep in our culture. Um, I've been reading the biographies of presidents just to try to understand how we got to where we are and how presidential leadership has played a role. Did you know that when Bill Clinton was in England and was about to leave thinking that he was going to ultimately have to serve in the military and go to Vietnam because he wasn't about to resist the draft because he had political ambitions and he thought it would ruin them. Not because he loved the country, but because he just knew politically he couldn't afford to be labeled a draft dodger. So when he left England thinking he would never come back, he went and visited the sites that he thought most important. And this is from his own memoir. You know one of the places he thought was important to visit? The grave of Karl Marx. Now my wife and I are planning a trip to Europe for our 50th anniversary, and you know, Karl Marx is not on the itinerary. I mean, think about that. Uh, uh, Trevor alluded to it. But out of Jerome, uh, 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 not Jerome, uh, um, uh, James Comey's own lips, he says when he was interviewed before being appointed U.S. attorney, first big appointment he got, he said that he was a communist. And he said to the reporter, I don't know what I am now. He said, I guess I lean kind of toward Republican policies. But he admitted that he was a communist. John Brennan, the first vote he ever took for president, he voted for Gus Hall, the chairman of the Communist Party USA. I mean, folks, this stuff is deep. You go to New York and the Bronx right now, uh, there's a place called Forest uh, Houses that is a project and right in the middle of the project, they've got a monument to Antonio Gramsci. I mean, this, this stuff is, has insinuated itself all over our country in ways that we don't even begin to notice. Because here again, this is the process. It's not violence. Now, they've always got that threat out there, don't get me wrong. But it's primarily with the subtle insinuation into the culture, so, so like the frog in the kettle, yeah. and it just boils hotter and hotter and hotter, and by the time the frog notices, he's already cooked. Right. And you know, we're almost already cooked. And we just gotta make sure that, okay, this is it. We're gonna kick the kettle over. <laughs> you know, this, this is not going to be allowed uh, to continue. And so folks, 
This whole thing of liberation, theology, and, and, and racism, let me come back to that for a second. This is Antonio Gramsci's way of, of replicating the class warfare that doesn't work in America. Because many of you, like me, you start from nowhere and you can, you can become anything you want to be in this country. I mean, you know, when I hear the complaints from people like um, Colin Kaepernick and don't get me started on him. But, um, you know, because anytime you're worth a hundred million dollars and you won't stand up for the flag of the country that made it possible for you to become a multi-millionaire running around on a grassy field throwing a leather ball, buddy, something's wrong with your brain. Somebody ought to make you stand up. But, um, look, race is the new class warfare. You see, because... You can't sell class warfare when people like you and me start poor and end up wealthier, end up doing very well. But if you can convince people that race is the injustice, then no matter how well they're doing, you can maintain that bitterness and that anger and that hatred and that frustration. You know, I hear people like Spike Lee, who lives in a multi-million dollar mansion, is worth probably a couple hundred million dollars, talking about how angry he is. And I'm thinking, angry about what? <laughs> and, and you know, LeBron James even talks about how, how difficult it is to be a black man in America. Living in a gigantic mansion worth almost a billion dollars today. And folks, if they lived anywhere, I asked Trevor about this. I said, well, how much do the sports players in New Zealand make, he said, well, if, if they make a few hundred thousand dollars, they're really doing well. They've hit it big time. And here, these athletes get multi, hundreds of million dollar contracts. And they're running around complaining because somebody's convinced them that, oh, oh, America's, America's racist. They're all out to get you. And by the way, folks, let me tell you how absurd this is. And don't you all be afraid to stand up. If anybody says anything to you, you come to me. I'll, I'll fight for you. But look, you know how absurd this is? When they look at me and say, I'm a white supremacist, you know it's going off the rails. <laughs> you know, I said, I grew up in the 60s. I never thought the day would come when I would be defending white people. <laughs> because th this, this stuff is sick. It's sick. The, the very thing that we were supposed to be ending, they're now reversing and turning it around. But this is a Marxist play. This is exactly what they have in mind to keep us balkanized, to keep us divided. Uh, I started stand, by the way, when Barack Obama got elected president because I knew that our country was in trouble then. I started stand, staying true to America's national destiny because I knew he wouldn't. And, and I had people say to me, as you as a black man ought to be supporting the black president. I, I would tell them, well, first of all, since he doesn't support my Jesus and doesn't support my God, I'm not supporting him. That's number one. But number two, I never believed that Barack Obama loved America. Think about it. I never heard him once speak about this country with any affection or any passion or, or any love or about our people. I mean, the only thing he knew to do was go to foreign countries and criticize our country and tell everybody what we weren't. And what he doesn't realize that the only reason he was able to become the leader of the free world, so to speak, was because of the decency of the American people who wanted to give somebody, even somebody like him, a chance. And I'll tell you what, I've said to people who voted for him, you can repent, that's one sin I didn't commit. So folks, we, we've got to stand up. Stand Against Communism was formed several months ago to do just that, to do two things essentially. Number one, awaken the American people because you are all aware of this, that's why you're here. But you know what, most of our fellow citizens aren't. They don't get it. I tell them, this is not business as usual, this is not a policy difference. Let me tell you something folks, this impeachment thing, this is not about a conversation with the Ukrainian president. This is about the fact that they hate you and me so much for having voted President Trump in, and they so disrespect and disregard our legitimate electoral process that they want to overthrow him. They want to get rid of him. And folks, communists never respect elections. 
unless they go their way. And that's exactly what we've got going now. They don't respect the election that got him uh, put into office. And, and, and you're right, Trevor, if this election in 2016, this president getting elected, drove them up the wall, and you know, a lot of them threatened to leave if he got elected, let's make them keep their promise and elect him again, okay? To say, please go, please go. Uh, somebody asked me about this. I talked about this earlier, and I didn't give this site, but somebody asked me about this. On, on August 24th, the Democrat National Committee had their summer meeting in San Francisco. They passed a resolution saying, we praise the values of the religiously unaffiliated. They are the largest religious group within the, Demo they call them a religious group, within the Democratic Party and that the religiously unaffiliated Americans overwhelmingly share the Democrat Party's values and we should advocate for rational public policy based on sound science and universal humanistic values and they criticize the Republicans for embracing religious people. So they're coming out with it now. I mean, it's just open. You can, you can Google that yourself. August 24th, a resolution praising the religiously unaffiliated. You know what that means? You Christians, shut up. Sit down. Get out of our way. Because we've got a plan for our country, this country that you all don't like, and we're going to get it implemented whether you like it or not. And you know what, folks, we need to be saying? No, not on our watch. Not on our watch. It's not going to happen. <laughs> folks, I hope you all share this with me and I'll be done. I said to God, I want to live long enough to see this country turned around. Here, here. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help make that happen. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it takes. You know, they, um, this the communist group uh, out in, uh, I think it was Denver, uh, went to the home of the warden of the ICE uh, camp that where they hold a lot of these illegal immigrants and they've been going around to the homes of these wardens and threatening them and threatening their families uh, and, ch and chanting let me see if I can find this stupid chant no borders no nations no racist de deportations let them all in close the concentration camps Folks, these people have lost it. They have completely lost it. And then threatened, and, and then chanted this. We know who you are, we know what you do, and we know where you live. I mean, if you do what I do, you're going, you're going to get threatened. You're going to get harassed. I've had people write me letters, I had one guy write me a letter saying, uh, don't come to California because what you're going to be, be met with won't be a welcome. Oh, I've already been several times. You know what I said? Look, folks, I believe in Jesus Christ. If they kill me, it's a promotion. But I don't believe, I don't believe they can do anything to me until I'm done the work I have here to do. And my attitude is this. If I have to be the last person on earth, the last person in this country standing up for that flag, the last one standing up for that constitution. The last one standing up for what this country represents and who we are. I will do it until I breathe my dying breath, but I will never give up. I will never give in. I will never back down. I will never turn this country over to a bunch of Marxists and socialists and communists to destroy this nation. We're going to make America, make sure that America remains the land of the free and the home of the brave. Look, we're, we're going to see to it that generations coming behind us will feel what we feel when that national anthem comes on. So this is why I get so angry when people disrespect it, because I feel something when that national anthem plays. When we, I, I, I watch people when, when it's time to salute the flag, and I, I watch people stiffen their backs and stand up, because we know that flag is not just a piece of cloth. It represents the blood 
the sacrifice of so many who have gone before us and made it possible for us to enjoy the freedom that we enjoy in this nation. Look, my ancestors were slaves and sharecroppers in Orange County, Virginia. But as far as I'm concerned, they made a sacrifice that would allow their great grandson to experience the greatest level of freedom and opportunity and hope that any people anywhere else on the world would ever receive. Folks, there is no better place on earth for anybody to live regardless of the color of their skin than the United States of America. I want generations to come behind us to feel what I feel when that national anthem plays, when, that, when the, those colors go up, when we sing those old patriotic hymns, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside, let freedom reign. And you know, I, I love those songs because they move my heart because I know what I could have been had I been born somewhere else, had I been given some other destiny. But my destiny was to be an American. And I tell you, I'm glad about that. And that last verse of that song says who we are and why we are who we are. It's a prayer. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. We're going to fight, and we want you all to fight with us. Sign up, be a part of Stand Against Communism. We can't come here and fight this fight for you, but we can certainly provide you with information and inspiration and help of whatever kind we can give uh, in order to help make sure that we save New Hampshire, because we got to save New Hampshire as part of the pathway towards saving America. So God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the fight you're in. God bless New Hampshire. God bless the United States of America. Donald Trump, if he wins, when he wins again, and I think there's a lot of things that have got to happen. Like I would love to see him, for instance, abolish the Department of Education. Hey. You can educate your children in New Hampshire values, not swamp values. I'd love to see him abolish, to get, he's already pulled America out of three United Nations bodies. I'd love to see him pull America right out of the United Nations. Yeah. Oh, wow. right. So, you know, you imagine, right now we've got all these young, young uh, kids that are all going crazy for Bernie Sanders, but Trump gets in again and they can finally move out of their mom's basement and they can get an $80,000 a year job and get married and have mortgages and kids, they're going to forget a lot of this crap. And, but this is, look, this is, we're going to fight this in every front because it's in the colleges, it's, uh, we've got to change that. You know, wouldn't it be great if instead of 50% of kids going to college, 20% of kids go, went to college, and the rest went to trade school and did apprenticeships? Right. Wouldn't that transform the country? So there's a whole bunch of things we can put into place that will transform the culture. So that, see, politics is downstream from culture. The culture shapes the politics. Politics and culture is downstream from religion. The religion shapes the culture, the culture shapes the politics. So we're gonna be working backwards here. We've gotta win the election, because otherwise we're done. But then we have to change the culture, and we have to restore the religion. So this is not going to happen overnight, but we've got to start somewhere. And we know that if we lose the election, everything else is for nothing. So yeah, look, it's an ebb and flow. We don't just we don't just win, and keep on winning. We win, we lose. We win, we lose. We win, we lose. But we've all been on a good trajectory lately, and we've got to keep that going for as long as we can. Yeah, let, let me let me add this. Ronald Reagan got elected after Jimmy Carter. Everybody remember Jimmy Carter? Yeah. I did repent for voting for him. Uh, and I really believe that they are they are setting us up with the craziness. Impeachment and and the Green New Deal. Uh, but what we gotta do is make sure that our voters are worked up. 
that they're that they're mobilized, that they're exercised, that they understand that's probably what we're doing. We're trying to sound the alarm and say, hey, everybody, this is critical. I mean, if you've never voted before in your life, you've got to vote. Look, I ran for office in Virginia, and I would go and talk to Christians, going to church every Sunday. Well, are you going to vote? Oh, no, nah, I, don't, I don't get involved. I said, well, do you realize if you don't, your liberty, your ability to freely worship, your ability to, to, to go out and hunt and have, have the guns that you want to have is going to be gone. Because, folks, if these people take over the country, all that's out the window. Your, your, your speech will be curtailed by hate speech. And guess what hate speech will be? Anything that doesn't agree with them. Your, your Second Amendment rights will be gone. So every one of us has to sound the alarm with our family members, with our friends, with our colleagues. And let me say one thing about the black vote. We're working hard on the black vote. I believe this president is going to shock people with the level of minority vote that he gets. Because just like a lot of people from different backgrounds, they made it hard for you to say you're a Trump voter. Because you might, you might end up in a fight. But I really believe there's a quiet support out there for President Donald Trump. It's not going unnoticed that he has fought for our First Amendment rights as Christian people. It's not going on notice that he, unnoticed that he's fought for our Second Amendment rights. We just got to make sure that people are informed and so they understand what's going on. Get off all this, oh, he's a racist. I wish he stopped tweeting. Pay attention to what the man is doing. The lowest unemployment rate among minorities in the history of keeping records. What more do you want? I mean, my goodness. So we gotta sell that. So, so we gotta mobilize our people. If we do that, we're gonna win. Uh, yes, ma'am. Let, let, let's get some. When Obama was running, we tried to vet him. And if anybody raised anything against him, we were called racist. Yeah. They're doing the same thing now, turning that around and everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. <laughs> Deflect it. Say, first of all, I'm not even buying that lie. This is about, this is about policy and about philosophy. Um, and then just go right back at the policy and the philosophy. Because, see, what they want to do is shut you down. They want to shame people into not speaking up. I mean, most of the time they don't call me racist, but they got some names. I don't care. I really don't care. There's too much at stake for that. So, so just, just don't let them back you off. I mean, all this stuff about the president being a racist because he said, you know, why are we taking country? Why are we taking people from certain countries? And then he used the phrase I wouldn't use, but, but nevertheless, we know what he meant. Well, he was right. I mean, he wasn't talking about the race of the people from those countries. Those countries. He was talking about the conditions of those countries and the problems that we are inheriting by bringing people from some of these places. And by the way, that includes Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe has got a lot of problems right now. And we've got a lot of e illegal immigrants from Eastern Europe. It wasn't a racial comment, but that's what they're always going to class it as. I would blow right through that and go right back at the issue. See, like um, a couple of years ago, you couldn't say the word socialism, you, you couldn't say the word communism, but when the President of the United States, States says it, he's opened a space for us right. to say things. Mm -hmm. You know, look, we don't have a problem, that's why I think it'll be Kamala Harris, because they need a, a person of colour so they can play the race card, because that's what the only, it's the only way they'll win an election, because they can't run on the economy, that's for sure. By the way, let me point out, we all have color. Just thought I'd throw that in. The only color I care about, I don't, you know, I cared about Obama's color in as far as he was red. <laughs> yeah. You know, but but it just look, this is what the bishop says. We need to enthuse our base and alarm our base, because I've seen surveys that said if Obama, if Trump runs against a generic Democrat. He's level pegging, maybe a little bit below. But if he runs against a Democrat perceived as a socialist, he wins by eight to 10 points. So he is very right to make this election about socialism and communism. We, you know, they call us racists and white supremacists and Nazis, and we call them liberals and progressives. We need to call them all the time Marxist, socialist, and communist, yes. the three wings of the Democratic Party. You know, we need to label them for what they are 
and that'll put them on the defensive because they've had us on the defensive for years. Every time they pull out the race car, we go on the defensive, you know. So you just brush it off, ignore it, and you go for the issues and call them for what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Marmar. I just want to say, as a nurse, when you look underneath the outpairing system, you see that there is a Thank you. Thank you, dear. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, I, I, don't, I don't know about that, you know. Well, let's come back to that one. Because uh, look, I want to try to get you all out by 9 o'clock, okay? Is that okay, yeah. Diane? Actually, you can say later if people want, but before you wrap up the question and answer, I really would like you to address your phone call, your yeah. teleconference, and invite people. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Rick, go ahead. And we also have some books there and t shirts as well. Some of my books and some t shirts. Yeah, I've got some books over here, but I, I, I happen to love this one. If you want to get into a debate, you can wear this, Stand Against Congress. Uh, we, we've got some of these over there. We wouldn't stand very long. Yes, ma'am. When, when the last election was the Absolutely. This, right. this, is Absolutely. Going, this is not going to be Republicans versus Democrats. We've got to make it Constitution versus Communism. That's what, that, what, what it is. And Communism versus Freedom. Yes, sir. Don't be afraid to say the words. Yes, sir. Go ahead. One of the things I. You don't tell me now to my job sound. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you. Uh, because you and I are in the same way. And I've been there ever since I was 68. But one of the things that I've tried to find in discussing intelligent with the other side, what I call the dark side, is the fact that you can sit down to two simple things, freedom versus slavery, period, and that's it. And once you get that, then you can start to expand on what is freedom, what is slavery, and then all of a sudden they start to start to say, I've been on the wrong side. Please, think of it that way. Who put out the bumper sticker that says socialism is, is slavery? Ah, uh, yeah, that that was you, Tony. There you go. Uh, because that's one of our slogans. Socialism oh, yeah. is slavery. Yep, absolutely. It says Bishop Jackson said the Grantius have redefined the terms. So they've told us that slavery is now freedom. You know, socialism is freedom. So you 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 right, you go to those things, you've got to define what those things are, what they really are, and then go out from there. But I, I just want to say too. We want to sign up everybody here who wants to be part of the team, but we are going to, all these Marxist candidates have to come through your state. Mm. And we can, um, we've got a pledge, a candidate pledge. Do you support, will you pronounce socialism, <coughs> communism? We are going to maybe do billboards. We've got a pack. We're going to do letters to the editor, social media, radio interviews. A voter guide a voter that guide. compares these candidates' positions yeah. with the Communist Party USA. Yeah, so, so we are going to ambush them as they come through the pass. Okay, so we want people who can help with that. Uh, the call is every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And all you've got to do is email me at ewj at standamerica.us. ewj at standamerica.us. I've also got cards back there. If you email me at the address on the card, which is my personal email address, president at standamerica.us, we will add you to the list. Uh, and you'll, we'll send you an invitation, okay, to join us. Because as you all know, we're trying to avoid being infiltrated. But we'll happily invite you if you just let us know that you want to be a part. Oh, thank you. I'm, and I've got a radio program that I'm using 
And if you all have ideas about guests or people that I need to talk to, I'm on American Family Radio. We're on 191 stations around the country. You can also hear me on AFR.net live stream from at 1 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. In fact, uh, is John still here? There you go, John. John came because he heard me on the radio. He listens at it, uh, on a station here in Manchester. So we do have a station here in Manchester. So it's another resource, folks. Let's let's use it. Yes, ma'am. Or some of their members. Some brave people have insisted, like the rabbi, a rabbi that has to take on the Massachusetts. How are you going to get them to help make people see that, that they're really being enslaved by this kind of ideology? Well, we have something understand. And I don't know, do we have any ministers taking a stand pamphlets over there? Do we have any ministers taking a stand pamphlet? Okay. Uh, we have something called Ministers Taking a Stand. Oh, we got, <laughs> John, John is my promoter here. Okay. <laughs> and we got, well, we got CDs over there. Uh, we got Ministers Taking a Stand, which, in, which, which is a network of ministers around the country who are of different backgrounds. Stand is not a black organization, but we've made a point to reach out to these black ministers. And what we're finding is this. The ones who are dedicated to truth, when they hear the truth, they respond and they gravitate to it. The problem is they just don't have anybody telling them the truth because you're, you're right, a lot of people are intimidated. And you know, you go around and I get up and speak to a group of ministers and they come up to me and say, man, thank you, thank you. You know, I'm going back to my church and I'm gonna preach what you preach. So we've got a network under ministers taking a stand and every time I get a chance, I'll meet with ministers. Just a quick testimony, one of my best friends today became a friend several years ago, having heard me in a meeting, something like this. And he said he and his wife went home in tears. Said because he realized they had been misled all their lives and were voting for things that were against the very faith that they were preaching. They've become some of my dearest friends. In fact, they laugh every time we see each other and get together. They say, you know, Bishop, it's hard to be your friend, but we don't care, we're your friend anyway. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's, it's working, it's working. Um, Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I have a few relatives and friends that uh, they say, well, I mean, we've been sliding towards socialism for a while, which is true ever since FDR. Um, how do I combat that? I don't, I, I've paid it, I get so to see it now, but I still see the system as wrong. The government should be running it. Um, what is the good thing to say to them to make them realize that uh, other than me just saying, I don't support these programs anyway. You know, they, they never should have been started. Yeah, well, you know, let's see, let's, let's get the government running McDonald's, shall we? And how long do you think it would be? That, how long do you think you can still go into a, a burger place and get a whole choice of burgers and a whole choice of milkshakes and at and, and cheap prices? How long do you think that would maintain? You know, the government, you know, we have, we have had some socialism, but it's been the free enterprise that's kept it all going. You get to the point like Venezuela, where it actually gets so bad that the free enterprise can no longer can sustain it. We all love sustainability, right? So, you know, it, go, it, goes, it goes off the edge, you know, and, and the big one I, I call is a socialised healthcare, because that is attractive to even some conservatives. Because yeah. you think, you know, they've wrecked the healthcare system with their regulation so much that it's now so expensive that people think, oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind it being free. Well, look, just look at it this way. If you live in a free market healthcare system, and I know it's not free market here, but you're a customer. Yes, I can see. And how do you business people treat your customers, folks? They're pretty darn good, right? But if you're in a socialized healthcare system, it's a fixed budget, but unlimited needs. And every procedure you have, every pill you take, is a liability on that system. How do you business people treat your liabilities? Gone. You know, my, my 75-year-old father, 85-year-old father, 
pay, pay taxes all his life, he goes hunting, he goes fishing, he plays ping pong, he's in great health, but he's got poor, bad shoulder ligaments. This is in New Zealand. So he goes to the doctor and says, how much would an operation cost to fix my ligaments? They say, oh, 10 grand, or can I get one? He says, you're 85 years old, you're not paying taxes, do you think they're gonna invest money in you? You know, they go and here's some painkillers. You know, just think about this. Christchurch Public Hospital in New Zealand. Socialised healthcare. You gotta say, maybe the oncology department might have a $20 million a year budget for chemotherapy. You got a seven-year-old girl in this bed with leukemia. You got a 75-year-old guy in this bed with prostate cancer. Each one will take 200,000 to treat. It's the end of the year. Your budget's getting pretty low, and the accountants have told you if you go over, it comes out of next year's budget. You really can only treat one of them. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? If you, you know, socialised health is great as long as you don't get sick or old. <laughs> you know? Look, the, the other thing that we should say, social security, while it has become a kind of socialist program, because now there's no money in any lockbox, the theory on which it was started was you work and pay into it and then collect back what you paid into it. So it was never really supposed to be a socialist program. It was supposed to be a program of security where, where the government, that's probably where we made our mistake, where the government was supposed to hold on to your money and give that back to you. It's now become, of course, a socialist program because there is no money in social security now. And every check that anybody gets from social security is on borrowed money. So, so look, Thomas Jefferson, and I'll just say it this way. Thomas Jefferson said, the government that is big enough to give you everything you need is big enough to take everything you have. At what point do you end up working for the government and become a slave for the government if you keep turning over every aspect of your life to the government? Um, John. I'd like to say this about racism. I have long held a belief that there is only one race. Amen. Every single scientific investigation has proved it. That makes me the biggest racist in the region, if not the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the Bible teaches, yes ma'am. Reverend, would you talk to uh, your audience about the film that you're working on? Yeah, um, as I said before, politics is downstream from culture. Culture shapes the politics. But politics is downstream from religion. The religion shapes the culture, the culture shapes the politics. So if your culture is a bit screwed up and your politics is off the wall, what's that telling you about your religion? Now, we're doing a movie called Enemies Within the Church. Well, I've already done one called Enemies Within, which, which basically said there's about 20% of your congressmen and 20% of your senators are working for the other team. Well, the Catholic Church, we all know, has been heavily penetrated to the point you now have a Marxist pope. Most of the mainstream Protestant churches in this country are the Communist Party of Prayer. But what has been pure and has been good for a long time have been the Evangelicals mm -hmm. and the Baptists, mm -hmm. right? They've stuck to their message, they've voted conservative, they've believed in the Bible and, and been true to the faith. Well, don't you think that might upset the left? These are the people who, who voted for Ronald Reagan and even worse, for Donald Trump. So there's been a heck of a big program over the last five years to infiltrate left-wing ideas into the evangelical and Baptist churches. The, ba the Southern Baptist, the largest Protestant denomination in the country, the most conservative, just adopted critical race theory at their conference in Alabama two months ago. That is Marxism. That is James Cone. That is the idea that you can only be a racist if you're part of the dominant culture. And so to end racism, you have to overturn the dominant culture, which is white, heterosexist, homophobic capitalism. It's as Bishop Jackson said. It's not the class struggle now. You just, you, you overturn the dominant structures of society. So when you've got the Southern Baptists adopting Marxism, when you've got 
Groups like the Gospel Coalition and Tim Keller promoting social justice like crazy in the evangelical churches and critical race theory and um, welcoming refugees from overseas and illegal immigration and we're all fired up about global warming. 80% of American Christianity is now going to the left. And that is gonna have huge impacts on our culture and huge impacts on our politics. So whether you care about the religious side or not, you should care about what's happening to American Christianity. So our next movie is gonna be Enemies Within the Church. And if you think we're shocked tonight, I've been shocked at what I've found. So please go to enemieswithinthechurch.com. You can see a trailer there, maybe flick in a few dollars to help us get it made. But anybody who cares about the future of this country should care about what we're doing in that movie. All right, we'll just take a couple more and then close out. I just want to put in a plug for the enemies within the movie. If you have friends, neighbors, coworkers that may be persuadable, but they don't pay a lot of attention to this stuff, that movie is, is, is a great resource to share with those people. Um, so you can pick it up, I'm sure, on Amazon. I think you sold out of those yeah. the other night, right, Trevor? Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime, too. We had an Amazon Prime for one month, and it got over a million views with no advertising, no promotion whatsoever. It's complete word of mouth. Um, anybody who hasn't had a chance, so we'll make this the last one, Tony. Very, very quickly, one of the things I forgot to mention here. Social justice is one of the things that's bothered me for a long time, and I finally found the answer. It's not social justice, it's misspelled. It's soul, S-O-U-L. Social justice. It's justice that emanates from the soul from in and not dictated from somewhere on the outside. So it's... it's yeah. So traditions, and then draw The word justice should not need a qualifier. No, right. You know, it's right. either just or it's not just. Right. And justice comes from God. Yes. And, and see, they want to they want to have justice imposed by the state based on their own perverted values. And that's so social justice has really nothing to do with justice. It has to do with taking what someone else has earned and giving it to someone else and rejiggering society after their own perverted image. So, well, listen, folks, uh, to, uh, we had a meeting today. It went great. And we'll be back at it again next Thursday at 3 o'clock. So if you want to join us, please do. If you've signed up, we'll get you out of notice. Uh, I think we've covered everything. Is there anything we haven't um, touched on? Well, just say, you know, like we'll be putting out memos, we'll be putting out uh, information packages that you can take to a meeting and talk all about, you know, Kamala Harris's background or put it on social media. And that, that will be on the standagainstcommunism.com website. Standagainstcommunism.com. Yes, yeah, so we. Your father came back, came against Earth. Sorry? Father, uh, Harry, father, he came up here. I know, he, I know, he got a bit upset with that. Yeah, I know, it was funny. But um, yeah, we just want to, we're going to hit New Hampshire and Iowa first, because this is the early states where these people have to come through, and we want to confront them with their sins right up. So it goes all over the country, so they can't get away with the scam. But we've done this to Obama in 2008. We might have been able to stop it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're going to do to try and make sure that these communists cannot get into the presidency, and that will help President Trump win his election. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Crook TV.